Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to episode 221 of Empty Betters. I'm your host, Harrison Scholes. I'm going to toss it across the screen to my co-host, Mr. Nick Manella. What's going on, my friend? Not too much right now, buddy, but uh, by the time people are listening to this, I don't know, a lot could be going on. I'm very fired up for this one because, one, it feels like it's been a month since we've talked, even though it's been, I think, like four or five days, but also because I will be seeing you both in person in a matter of about 24 to 36 hours. So could not be more excited for that. Fired up to get this cup final previewed. Let's have a day. Absolutely. We got a nice little uh, empty betters beach weekend coming up. We will be uh, all together for game one of the Stanley Cup finals. Do with that information what you will. God knows what the next episode could have in store. But uh, I am now going to toss it across the screen to my other co-host who is not in Milwaukee this week, but is in the land of fine living, the 410, Mr. Mac Vogel. What's going on, my friend? Good to be home. I, uh, I've i already packed a whole bunch into I've been home since what it's Tuesday or it's Wednesday now. I've been home since Sunday, uh, just a couple hours after I landed Sunday morning. I was already at the greatest ballpark in the MLB Camden Yards. Um, so that was great. I uh, got to hang out with some buddies there. Then um, had a little had a little bonfire with some friends at my house after. And then on Monday, I went to Hershey Park. So that was fucking awesome. I haven't been there since I was a kid. Uh, really great roller coasters. Fun to be there while the uh, the Bears are doing as well as they are. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But uh, yeah, as Nick mentioned, we got some fun planned for this weekend. I'm pumped to see you guys. And uh, yeah, it's good to be home. Absolutely. So we got a jam-packed episode. We've got an interview. We've got cup finals previews. We've got you know uh, conference finals recaps. Little AHL action, gambling previews. We got a lot coming at you. It's going to be a good episode. Um, so before we get into the news, let's just address the interview for today. We are joined by Puck Picks, one of the newest up and comers on that NHL Twitter gambling space. Has been on an absolute rocket ship in the playoffs. So I will. We'll touch on it in the interview. It's up a bajillion units. We'll just put it that way. So uh, definitely go give him a follow on Twitter. Uh, he's going to have a ton of Stanley Cup final picks and also always good value. I respect that. None of that minus 180 bullshit, giving the people some decent juice to work with. Uh, we are going to hop into the news. And then after that, we'll do our recaps and previews. And then we'll end it with trivia and get you all out of here. Um, before we start, Nick, I think you have a good uh, QOTD. Yeah, we're going to bring it back for the cup final. So my question to you guys is what Stanley Cup final matchup that you watched either growing up or recently sticks out in your memory as your favorite? And just a disclaimer, you're not allowed to say one with your favorite team. So Mac and I can't say 2018. Harry can't say 09, 16 or 17. So it's got to be something without the Caps or the Penguins in it. I actually have one pretty handy. What about you, Matt? You go first. I don't know why. This is one that always stands out to me, but uh, maybe because I watched with my dad and it was when I was really getting into hockey um, and right before the lockout and my Aunt Vicky, God bless her, Tampa Bay Lightning fan, I have a sweet spot for that 4 final uh, between the Bolts and the Flames. I just remember like, when I was a kid and LeCavier and again, La dropped them. That was one of the coolest moments ever. I remember watching game seven with my dad in the living room and that infamous Fata Tanko from Gary Thorne, man, that just, that hits different. What a hell of a series. That, that one is probably my answer. I'm going to kind of cheat and say two. I it, going along the lines of Harry, like there were, there were actually two that, got me into hockey as a young kid. And the first two I really remember were the Canes Oilers one. And then the, uh, what was it? Uh, Mighty Ducks and Senators, right? Oh, yeah. seven. Yeah. Those two were the first that I remember like watching and being really into. And like, I fully knew what was going on in both of those series. Um, but like the, if we're talking recent one, that one that really stuck out to me, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer, but blues Bruins, I know it was a great one. I know game seven wasn't great. It was kind of a blowout, but um, I remember being pretty dialed into that series and, and watching with a lot of buddies in Milwaukee. Um, so that, that, that would be like my modern answer. I'd say. 
Nice. It's so funny that you guys said like 0405 and 0607 because I'm going to say 0304 <laughs> between oh, Ducks the Devils. Ducks Devils and uh, last cup final to have the Con Smythe go to a member of the losing team with uh, yeah. Jiggy. So that was awesome. I remember that was like one of the first ones where like even though the games were in Anaheim and I was back living on the East Coast by then. I was kind of allowed to like stay up and watch a little bit of like those later games. And that was just so cool. Oh, also nostalgic. I love it. Oh, that. yeah. Also special shout out. This one kind of obvious, but 2011. I mean, the Bruins, oh, I, Bruins Canucks was so, so lit. I mean, for a fly I, on the wall too. Like that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, 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 so good. I was surprised that wasn't one of the first answers, but that actually segues perfectly into our first news piece uh in that 2011 run for the canucks we all remember the uh the riots after the game well espn decided to do a 30 for 30 about that game seven and all the aftermath uh that is going to be aired on espn plus i believe you can listen to that now the day that you're listening to this yeah you can watch that now i think it premiered tuesday uh, okay. however many days ago that was, but it looks great. I'm definitely going to check that out, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see like what the footage is like from that one. Cause I'm sure they had a lot to choose from. Yeah. I, it's going to be cool to see how they handle it for sure. That is going to be the first thing I do when we are done this recording is go watch that. Uh, in terms of AHL updates, I know Mac talked about it earlier when he mentioned Hershey. Uh, I'll let you guys, since you guys are dialed into the Bears a little more than me, kind of give a uh, update on how Hershey's doing and then how Coachella Valley's also doing. Nick, you get Hershey, I'll get Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, I think we're looking at a repeat of last year's final, which is crazy, and those were two loaded teams. But right now the Bears are up three zip on Cleveland. They had a monster 6-2 win last night. They looked great, got scoring up and down the lineup. A um, little homer bias here, but great to see Miro and Snively scoring. So that's awesome. Uh, ton of great players on that Bears team. And honestly, on the Cleveland team, and Mac, I'm sure you've seen this on the, on the Western side of things too. Like I'll, I think a lot of the guys – that are playing in these conference finals and Calder cup finals will be in the NHL within a year or two. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that, that, that Hershey series, it's a little closer than, than it seems on paper. I mean, games one and two, both went to OT and the bears are just clutch in those situations, managed to win them both. And then, as you said, game three, a little bit more of a blowout um, on the other side, man, it's just been a, a struggle. Milwaukee was in this exact position last year the admirals played coachella valley in the conference final last year and just weren't able to get over that hump and it's looking like more of the same this year they're down 3-0 um that coachella valley team is nasty i mean they've got chris dreger and net who's obviously played plenty of plenty of nhl games for the kraken um so he's he's more than capable to to shut it down at the ahl level and um, I mean, you've got Shane Wright just like on um, fully on that team because he hasn't really been able to crack the NHL yet. So it, it's just it's it's a tall task. The Admirals, they've had a great season. They've been really impressive. I wouldn't say it's over yet. They've um they've had their backs against the wall several times in these posts uh, in these playoffs so far and, and uh, managed to to get out of it. So we'll see. I think I read a stat the other day that said they're like 12 and three in elimination games this season this postseason or something like that they've played several elimination games already so um anyway we'll see how it shakes out but yeah it definitely is looking uh looking like we might get that rematch of coachella and hershey and i think the crazy thing about that is like seven games was not enough to settle that series last year it was literally decided by one goal which is just crazy yeah, that's right absolutely insane yeah, nice little AHL update. Never want to forget about those guys. Um, and Dan Bilesma, the newly appointed coach of the Seattle Kraken, still uh, working with Coachella Valley there. So that's a nice little storyline. Who's yeah. that coach for the Bears? You yeah. know, stay remember. tuned. Yeah, I was just, I'm just interested because they're always so good year in year out, and uh, I'd be interested to know who their coach was. But yes, it does look like it's going to be a rematch. Todd Nelson. There you go. I knew that. I don't know why I didn't. I don't know why I blanked on the name either. 
damn. I should have right. just said not Spencer Carberry, but there you go. That works. Uh, all right. That does it for the uh, outside of NHL news. We are going to hop into the conference finals recaps, which is presented by our friends over at Kane Footwear. Nick, I think you have a word from our friends over at Kane. Absolutely. You guys know this episode is brought to you by Kane Footwear, the ultimate choice for hockey players, both on and off the ice. After a tough game, your feet deserve some TLC, and that's where Kane Footwear comes in. Their shoes are designed to provide the perfect balance of comfort and support, helping you recover faster and get back to the game you love. So whether you're hitting the rink or the outdoors, make sure you're wearing Kane Footwear. Visit the Kane Footwear link in our bio today to find your perfect pair. Kane Footwear, the official recovery shoe of empty betters. And stay tuned because I have a feeling that all three of us are going to be wearing those on the beach and throughout Ocean City all this weekend. Absolutely. Best beach yeah. in the market. I actually, uh, one last thing on Kane. I, I wore my Canes to Hershey Park and I realized they might be the best shoe for something like that, like an amusement park, because you're walking around all day. I think I walked over five miles just walking around the park all day. And, uh, there's also like water rides and stuff. So you kind of don't know if you want like a sneaker, if you're going to get wet or whatever. So just, just a great hybrid shoe. That's true. Like if you're one of the people who, I don't know why you would ever do this, but choose to vacation at Disney world and your kids are dumping ice cream and piss and shit all over your feet. Very easy to hose off at like the horse cleaning stations in Disney, which is good. Wow. Love it. I guess you're not taking your uh, kids anywhere in the future towards. Uh, if I ever have children, I will never take them to Disney World. Absolutely not. Fully noted. I'm on that oh, train. Fuck no. Absolutely not. No. All righty. So since we last spoke, a lot has changed, ladies and gents. The last time we spoke, the Dallas Stars had a 2-1 series lead over the Edmonton Oilers. And immediately after our last recording, the Dallas Stars actually had a two to nothing lead in game four in the first period. And I remember we were all texting each other. This is a epic meltdown. And man, oh man, did Edmonton turn it on because they come back and win that game four and the series winning three straight games, game four, game five, and game six. Obviously, a decent amount of time has passed since some of those games. So we're probably going to focus more so on the most recent one in game six, but I just want to hear your overall thoughts on the Oilers and their performance in this series to go to the Stanley cup for the first time since 2006. Well, first thing I feel like we have to talk about the Oilers is, you know how we've sort of talked over the course of this year about what's the start of their Stanley cup DVD. We might need to have some censorship on what the start of their Stanley Cup DVD is because they are unbeaten since that <laughs> happened. Oh, Just saying. You mean the 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 two crucial the two crucial X factors of the series? The, the two very good points that were made by the by the audience. Gotcha. <laughs> Jesus. Uh in all in actuality though, like let's just talk for a second about this Stanley Cup act or the Stanley Cup DVD starts with the first 20 games of the season, no one thought this team was making the playoffs. Like yeah. it's kind of crazy to think back to October and, and November and, and think about what a dumpster fire this organization looked like. And here they are in the fucking Stanley cup final. I, I will be the first to say, I'm quite impressed with the way they handled the stars. I'm kind of still in di in disbelief that the stars are eliminated. If, uh, if I'm keeping it a Billy. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, you know, we've been hard on this Oilers team. I won't I won't run or hide from that. I've definitely been critical of them, I would say, for the majority of this year. And for them to sack up like that and beat a team that had beaten Vegas and then had really kind of handled Colorado, I mean, that's that's just so impressive. However, actually never mind. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna save it because we're gonna preview the series. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I don't. I just if you're listening, it's not all fine and dandy, okay? I got a lot to say. I got a lot on my mind about the Oilers here. The Stanley Cup DVD will start with the famous GIF that has made its way around the internet this week as the Oilers are going to the uh, the finals. There's a clip or turned into a GIF now of Leon and Connor when they were I think like two and ten or two nine and two or whatever before Woodcroft got canned, and they're on the bench. They're in the white Oilers uniforms, and they're. They, I think Leon gives 
Connor the nod and Connor gives Leon the nod back. And then they, they do like the little head nod. They're like, all right, we're, we fucking suck, but like at least us two are good and we're the only two good players and we get it. And at that moment, like, that's the kind of dynamic duo behavior that I just, I, I live for seeing that kind of shit. Like, all right, we're going to get through this. We're going to go the distance. We know we're going to turn it around. And they did. And uh, of course, this is the first playoffs since we started this podcast where I actually haven't bet one single dollar on the, on the Oilers in the playoffs. That may or may not change in the finals. Stay tuned. We'll get you. We'll get you a couple orange crushes deep this week. I was going to say it's like open, loading up the DK one account. beer. It's like I'm putting my <laughs> life savings on the Oilers. Hell yeah! And uh, Stuart fucking Skinner. Let's talk about Stuart Skinner here for a second. I made Mr. Fun of him. Uh, Mr. Mario Kart. Yeah, I made fun of him. Mac made fun of him. Like when the whole Picard drama. Like we, I'm guilty. I I'll call myself out on that. This dude lost his job in round two, and he just played the game of his life in game six to clinch on home ice the Western Conference Finals to go to the Stanley Cup. And I can't believe that Stuart Skinner is going to be the starting goalie for a Stanley Cup team. It's I'm happy for him. I really am. Stanley Cup final team. Let's fucking relax. Oh, okay, fine. What did I say? I don't even know. I'm getting too excited. Stanley Cup team. Okay. Nick, what are your what are your thoughts right now? It's it's honestly I'm I'm kind of in agreement with you. It's just watching what McDavid and Drysaitel have done and them sort of willing this team into the Cup final is great. But I also think that the Oilers are getting help from other places. Like if you had Philip Broberg scoring in Game Six, you're lying. Like there's no way anyone on this planet was like, you know, who's going to score tonight? Philip Broberg. So you know, it's just. It's insane to see what they've done. And honestly, I could not be happier for a guy like Ryan Nugent Hopkins. He's been there for how many years? He's the only one left out of those, what, three or four consecutive first overall picks they had. Never complained, never asked for a trade, just took it, sucked it up, and the guy's going to have a shot at a ring. That's a great point. Yeah, good for him. And had an absolute massive game five to propel the Oilers to a series lead. Had two goals in that game. He was a monster. Um, You know, he just talked about it. The Oilers fans have been through so much in the last 18 years. From the Yakupov to Taylor Hall to, you know, like Dustin Penner being their best player maybe at one time. Like, it's just been a war. The Jack Campbell contract and everyone, like, it's been crazy. And here they are, Connor McDavid, the best player on the planet, going to the finals against who I would call the best team in the NHL and against the best defensive player in the NHL. We'll talk about all this later. I want to ask this before we move on. Uh, Does McDavid have to win the cup to really cement like his legacy? Like, will you look at him differently if he loses in the finals? To me, no. To the media, yes. I also don't think it has to be this year. Like, it's not like... Like, here's the thing. It would suck. They'll be pissed, obviously, rightfully so. But I don't necessarily think that this Oilers team is cup or bust right now. I do kind of, we'll get into it more. I do kind of think Florida in some ways is cup or bust right now. Not because they're like going to be totally different next year, but just you cannot go to two straight cup finals and lose both of them. Like that, you you can't fucking do it. We're not the Buffalo Bills here. <laughs> I think Paul Maurice even, or uh, no, Knobloch even made the Bills comparison in the in the press conference. It's like, They're not the Bills, but they are the Sabers. <laughs> yeah, uh, they actually are. They are. Yeah, we'll like you know how the it. you know how the Lightning are the Tampa Bay Rangers. These are the Florida Sabers. You're so right. Yep. Yeah, we'll again talk about that all in a second. Um, just to kind of recap Game Six a little bit because I know everybody's already seen the four and five highlights, and you know that's the nature of media, but Stuart Skinner, 34 saves, game of his career. Connor McDavid in the first period absolutely took over. I know that first goal made its way around the internet. It was the first shot on goal for the Oilers in that game. Um, an unreal toe drag against a Norris caliber defenseman in Heiskanen. And then he makes that sweet little dish pass uh, over to Hyman for that second goal. And from there, like Nick, I know you said this many times as playoffs, the Oilers are winning games in a fashion that we're not used to. And that's what the, what the difference is this year. They lock it down. They do, they did, 
got what 10 shots on net the least amount ever in a Dude, conference like clinching game seven minutes to go in the third they had nine combined shots on goal and like what how many of them had gone in two or three by that point it was insane yeah i mean they're they're they they can lock it down and that's something they haven't been able to do in the past and they got a little bit of depth guys like i i know we've trashed it a little bit this year but like you know there's some guys who are having some coming out parties look at connor brown i think he's played great he's looked tremendous in my opinion um and they still got yeah, at home, I mean, God, that addition. Honestly, good for Connor Brown, too, to to have the season that he had and to to find a way to fucking keep your head up and and not let that just totally get to you. That's that's pretty impressive from like a, a mental and, and sports psychology standpoint. For sure. Uh, and then you look at Dallas. I mean, real quick, we'll touch on them a little bit. Joe Pavelski probably retiring. Um, just an absolute pure American salute to to little Joe, as they call him a uh, little brother of jumbo Joe and the sharks back in the day. Uh, one of the best American players of all time. I believe I saw this stat today. He has the most playoff goals ever amongst a American born player. I think just his, the amount of playoff games he's played alone is a bonkers enough stat. The guy made the postseason in 16 out of the 18 years he's been in the NHL. And, you know, you could say like, Oh, those sharks teams were pretty good. They weren't all that great, man. Like, I mean, there were some years where it was pretty slim pickings in the Bay Area. So, like you said, Captain America, I mean, it's hard to think of a, a better ambassador for USA Hockey than Joe Pavelski. And definitely a guy that if he does hang them up right now, I really hope he goes into broadcasting. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. That'd be sick. Just, I mean, like he's so cerebral and so smart. Like everyone talks about like his smartness around the net with the tipping, with the making the plays behind the net and everything. I just think his analysis would be fantastic. You know, this is, this is kind of one of those series where I feel like Dallas just kind of ran out of gas. And I know that's kind of stating the obvious, but you play Vegas off the bat. That's going to take its toll on you. Colorado, even though they got it done in, and I think what, six games that took its toll on them. Um, and then you compare that to Edmonton. I mean, I know Van took them seven, but they get that sweep against LA. Um, you know, that 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 will save you recovery and injuries down the road. And I think this is kind of a prime example of that. Uh, I mean, Dallas's window is still wide open, but good season for them. It's a good season for them. It was tough. I know I was pretty high on this team as I have been for the last two and a half years. But uh, yeah, you know, it's sometimes you just run into a buzzsaw. Sometimes it's just not your year. And I think that's sort of the look you could see on every single one of the Stars players faces after that game. You know, each one of them could probably go, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, that team left it all out there. I, you know, they should absolutely be very proud of the season they had. Yeah, it's not really one of those things where you're like, ah, fuck, we'll, well, now we know all the holes on this team. We're going to assess them over the offseason. It really is just like, a, yeah, it did, just, we didn't fucking win. And that happens. Tough. Uh, and the Oilers did not touch the trophy, I believe. I think they stayed clear. So if you're superstitious, those are some people watching that. Uh, we're going to move out east, and then we're saving a lot of this episode for the uh, cup preview stats, matchups, all that good stuff, so we'll get into it. Uh, the Panthers and the Rangers. The Florida Panthers storm back after being down 2-1, to one, just like the, uh, the Oilers did here, and they win the series in six games. They win game four, game five, and game six. Low-scoring, gritty hockey is what this series screamed to me in the last three games, a three, two game, a three, two game and a two, one game. Nick, your thoughts on the Florida Panthers and this series as a whole. Well, first of all, Mac, great job between you and I, our reverse psychology plan to get the Rangers eliminated from the playoffs worked. So massive success all around for the EB team. Uh, great success. <laughs> I mean, it, it was almost like, you know, like the Rock'em Sock'em robot toy. This That's like how I envision this series where the two guys are just punching each other in the face and at the end one of their heads pops up and it's like, okay, you're gone. It's like, was it going to be the blue guy in the Rangers or the red guy in the Panthers? We didn't know. And, you know, when that game went to, what was it, game four goes to overtime and Reinhardt scored like a minute in, I was like, yep, that's it right there. Uh-huh. It's happening. And yeah, it's that just, was massive. Like you can tell, I know Mac, I think you talked about this last episode, like the drive that's in that Florida team 
just to get back, not even to go back and win it, but just to get back is something I don't think we've seen in a long time. Like Tampa, when they won it, they did not have that kind of drive to get back. They just went back somehow and did it again. But I I would look out because that Panthers team is dangerous. And Harry, like you said, probably the best team in the NHL. I'm pretty sure all of us had them missing playoffs in the preseason, by the way. Just don't know yeah, I think we did. <laughs> Age, aged perfectly. Uh, Mac, you've got the jersey on, a nice retro one at that. Uh, I want to hear what you have to say about this team. Yeah, I mean, I I mostly echo what Nick said. Impressive, really impressive what they did. Um, I, I really just feel like saying, boys, we fucking did it. Like, there were so many, there were so many recipes for a dog shit cup final. We could have had the Rangers in there. We could have had Boston in there. We could have had Vegas. So many teams that I just fucking hate. And we ended up with Edmonton and Florida. That's great. I'm not going to be mad either way. I mean, I want the Panthers to win, but before I say anything else, just hats off for that, right? Yeah, this this is one of the rare instances where I feel like the two teams in the finals are probably like deserving I mean, obviously, you're always deserving, but they're two of the best teams that have played this playoffs. No gimmicks. Yeah, yeah and I, I think more so. It, it's kind of rare that you get two teams that, I mean, maybe it's just us because we're Caps and Penguins fans, so neither of these teams really are big rivals. But in general, I feel like neither of these teams are too hated. I mean, the Oilers sure have their Canadian rivals. There's some, you know, there's some hatred from Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, whatever, but in general, I think most of most of the U.S. looks at this cup final and is like, yeah, sure, whatever. And let's be real. Like last year with Florida and Vegas was kind of a dud because it ended in what? Four or five games. So five, I think. right? Five. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's exciting at the prospect of a bigger matchup. Obviously, the prospect of the best overall player in the world having a chance to contend for a championship in this sport, I think is just great. Like, obviously, you you dream about that scenario. We had been saying for how many years, like, this guy needs to be in the cup final, which is great. But, I, you know, I think there's just as many players on the Florida side to be excited about. You're looking at guys like Reinhardt, who's having this unbelievable breakout season. Kachuk, who's going to draw attention if he's in a phone booth. Barkov, who's, I would say, probably one of, if not the best all-around player in the NHL that no one is talking about. So... Uh, And then we haven't even gotten to goaltending yet with Bob. So uh, we'll not be mad at all if that guy wins a cup for the amount of crappy teams that he's played for. I'm so fired about Bob. He's such a, he's such a cool player. But um, before we, before we jump head first into this preview, let's just put a, put a button on the Rangers season here. Um, I mean, here, here's the thing. Lafreniere really, really showed he's the real deal. Good for him. Igor, obviously incredible. Nothing more, nothing more he could have done. Um, you know, you got guys like Kako, probably not going to play again for the Rangers. There, there's a lot of things that I think the Rangers kind of learned from this, this run. They obviously, I think it was a pretty impressive run for the most part. I'm honestly, I'm pretty pleasantly surprised with the Panthers ability to eliminate them. But for, for a while, I really felt like no one was going to be able to stop this team. And uh, the Panthers were somehow able to, to really mute guys like Kreider, Mika Panarin, which is impressive. I was worried when they started making like all those comparisons to the 94 team, Uh, just like in how the series were playing out and everything. I was like, Oh God, don't do this again. But I don't know whether that bit them in the ass or what, but I, I think you nailed it. Like that that top trio was really not a factor in the series. And then you go back and look to the series before where Kreider basically won that decisive game for them by having a hat trick in the third period. You know, that that didn't happen in in this series. And I think that's absolutely something you can point to and say this is where it went wrong for the New York Rangers. And I think too, like the Capitals, obviously, the Canes, too. These are teams that have some bright spots, but can be exposed. I think they, I don't think the Rangers benefited at all from from getting those two teams as matchups. And I, before everyone freaks out that I'm grouping the Canes and the Caps into the same 
bucket here. Obviously, I recognize the Caps are way worse than the Canes as a as a full team. But that being said, I think the Rangers were fully able to expose the flaws of both of those teams. And then suddenly they run into the fucking Florida Panthers and they're like, holy shit, where are the holes? Where are the weaknesses? Like, what can what can we fucking do here? Yeah. And that's that's I was pretty convinced that the Rangers were going to win this series. I really was. And the reason why is, you know, after game four, like Nick, you said, Reinhardt scores it. And if you're a Panthers fan or even a not a Panthers fan, you're like, okay, here we go. My whole thing all series was their three best players haven't done anything and the series is tied and it's going back to MSG for game five. I lost money. I'm not even going to say I bet my money. I did bet my money and I lost it that those three would wake up and that the Rangers would somehow advance to the finals. I really did think that. But the Florida Panthers are the better team, the deeper team, the tougher team, the more physical team. I mean, they just – they they come in waves. They never fucking stop. Our friend Mark said it perfectly. He goes, Carolina is always known as their forechecking and their penalty killing because of Brenda Moore. He said the Panthers are like that, but on steroids. And that's true. It, you know, you get the Bennett's and the Kachuks and the Lundell, like all these guys, they just piss in vinegar hockey. That's the lo- adjective I love to use. It's that. Add in, I know we've said it a million times today and in previous episodes, but it's all of that, what you just said, plus the fact that they were in the fucking cup final last year, most of these guys, and they're this close to get like, it's just... It's a near impossible task if you're the Rangers and you get this team in the conference final to stop them from getting back there. It, it really is like just it's near impossible. Their motivation is just on a completely different level. And Harry, I think you make a great point about game five, you know, the one that you lost money on. I think if it's like if the Rangers were going to grab a hold of that series, Panarin has won, Mika has won, Kreider assists on both or some variation of that that's the game that you needed your superstars to step up and take control and say, we're going to go out and win you this game. And the rest of the team can come along if they want to. And I I don't want to point to that and say that that's why they lost the series, but I I don't think that can be overlooked. You you can totally do that. Yeah. And the scary part, if you're New York, like, you know, let's say you run out of depth and you just got beat by a beat by a better team. Let's say Goodrow has a bad run and their fourth line didn't look good with like Cooley and, and Rempe. That wasn't the case. The depth showed up. Your top three paid offensive players didn't show up for the second straight postseason in a really meaningful series. Like for me, if I'm a Rangers fan, that's the concerning part. The core guys are the problem, right? And Truba, your captain. I know he played with a broken ankle. Kudos to him. I could never imagine that. But that was not his best display of work. To be fair, though, let me play devil devil's advocate for a second, which is crazy that I'm actually going to go to go to bat for the Rangers a little bit here. But but hear me out. Guys like Panarin and Kreider and and me, maybe Mika, I'll leave him out of this for, for now. But let's talk about Kreider and Panarin. They played phenomenal in the first two rounds of, of the postseason like they you don't even get to the third round without those guys. So to, to say they were like invisible and like to say like, Oh, the, that's the problem is, is guys like those. I'm not sure that's totally fair because again, is it, is it that bad or that shocking to get to the conference final by riding guys like those? And then a really good team finds a way to stop them. Like, I, I think that's just, if anything, to me, it's just more impressive by the Panthers. I, I think it's a bit of an overreaction shocker from Rangers fans um, by just like totally pouring it on some of their star players here who happen to have a, I wouldn't even say a bad series again. It's just like, they got fucking, they got a handle. Like they just, yeah. Paul, Paul Maurice did his thing and they found a way to handle some of these guys. And I think you can point to coaching a little bit. You know, I, I think you make a great point there. I would say I, I think Panarin fell off a little bit more than I would put Kreider or Mika in there. I for, for me, his first round was amazing. Totally lit up the caps. I mean, then again, who wouldn't? But, you know, it is what it is. Kreider obviously, you know, carried you into the third round with that decisive win in, in game, what, five or six against the Canes. So, yeah, I think maybe you look at coaching then, you know, did did Maurice outcoach LaViolette? You know, I know that was a an intense coaching matchup for a couple reasons going into this. 
What did you guys think of uh, goaltending in this series? Do you put any blame on Igor at all for any of this, or is that pretty much no, a wash? Of course not. No, this no. was this was one of the best goaltending matchups we've seen in any series in a long time. It was fantastic to watch. I agree. It, yeah, uh, the two the two Ruskies, man. I mean, that was the battle of Russia right there. They were. I know Vasilevsky always gets in there, but this season maybe not as best. These two guys right now are the best two Russian goalies in the league, in my opinion, and. It was a hell of a duel. Um, yeah, I know the uh, the drama for the blue shirts is already swirling. We've got Brady Kachuk rumors flying left and right. How do we get Alex Tuck? We need a new center. Mika can't do, like all everything and anything's thrown out there. It's gonna be a fun off season, I can tell you that. Um, but yeah, the Panthers are going back to the finals. I believe. I believe they are the first team since the Penguins in 08 and 09 to go to the finals, lose, and then get back the next year. I'm pretty wow. sure I'm right on that. I think you are. That was the Red Wings back-to-back years. So, um, all right, we're going to move on to the Stanley Cup Finals preview. Um, before we get into all the nitty-gritty details, fun stats, matchups, um, we're going to ta- actually toss it off to our friend Puck Picks to do the gambling preview for this specifically, uh, and then we'll do – uh, all the matchups and all that stuff. So without further ado, uh, we're going to toss it off to Puck Picks right now. All righty. Well, it is now my pleasure to welcome on to the Empty Betters podcast for the first time, Puck Picks, a.k.a. Jackson. Jackson, we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, first first podcast I've been on, so it's a good way to uh, to pop the cherry. I think it's uh, it's a good one for it nowhere to go but up either that's always a good thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can't get lower than here but uh yeah man been been following your picks for the last couple of months uh you are on one hell of a heater over the course of the nhl playoffs uh thank, i know a you. lot of a lot of people listening are probably followers of you if you're not definitely go follow him at puck picks does picks have a z or an s i can't remember stuck with an s that's a fancy and then there's a one at the end Gotcha. And we'll tweet this all out so you guys can all follow him if you don't already. Um, so let's just chat real quick about what you've seen so far this playoffs. Um, I know there's been a couple players that you really like specifically, uh, and then we'll talk more about the cup final in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we've been blessed with a hell of a postseason so far. You've had, you know, the storylines of of crazy first round matchups with you know, uh, Dallas and, and Vegas in round one, Dallas going down 2-0 and coming back, winning two more. You've had, you know, uh, the Rangers winning seven in a row to start. You've had Edmonton battling through some tough series to to get McDavid to his first, you know, cup finals appearance. And you've had Florida this whole time just sort of, you know, lurking in wait and and just just ready to to pounce, for lack of a better word, with the Cats. And And I think, you know, I'm biased. I would have loved the Rangers Oilers final, but uh, I think just from a hockey perspective, like the hockey we're about to get to see between the way Florida plays and the way we know Edmonton plays, I think that that it's going to be one hell of a treat. Uh, I'm really excited for it to get started. Uh, and and I think that, you know, a couple of guys that maybe, you know, would be worth keeping an eye on in this series. I think one thing that that's interesting to, to, to think about, and it's become a bit of of a narrative over the last week without there being much hockey on is the play of Alexander Barkov and rightfully so. If you look at the guys that he's been able to shut down over the last three rounds, it's it's really impressive, right? Like he shut down Matthews, he shut down Pasternak, and he shut down Panarin and Bohr. And so the thing I'm most excited about is, especially in game one with Paul Maurice having that final change, is Barkov versus McDavid. Um, I, I, I said this on Twitter earlier, but it fe- really feels like that immovable object versus an unstoppable force and i don't know which is which and i don't know who's going to prevail but to me that matchup is going to be sort of dictating the series right like i i haven't been a huge believer in stuart skinner he's proved me wrong and he's played great hockey and if he keeps it going like i think that that you know goaltending might not be the mismatch people thought and i think the real thing will come down to can florida stop these top guys right can they stop the big guns and once you break that down, I think one, the answer is I have no clue yet. And that's why I'm excited about game one. But two, I would keep an eye on some of the depth on both sides of the puck here for, for both teams. 
I think that when you look at the way that Florida ended that series with guys like Tarasenko and Rodriguez and Bennett really starting to contribute, Matthew Kachuk hasn't scored, it feels like, in forever. I know he scored in game one. Berkegi was kind of quiet. Barkov was playing lights out defense. So I wouldn't imagine scoring was too much on his mind. And we did see Sam Reinhardt start to heat up a little bit. But I, I would keep an eye on some of those depth guys, like I said. Even an Anton Lindell could could really have a big series. And on the Edmonton side of things, I'm interested in, in you know, how Evander Kane plays and how Warren Fogel plays if he gets back in. Yes. Yeah. So that's one of the things I, I love about your picks in particular is that you go after the simple but uh, worthwhile player props. I'll use Jamie Benn as an example. I know you love that guy. I love that guy. Fucking, how could you not? He gets you, you know, him to get a point, even money almost every night or close to it enough to be right. where, where it's like, OK, I can hammer this and it's actually realistic and he's going to have a 50 50 shot, you know, playing with Stan Coven and Johnston power play time. It's a match made in heaven. You're not taking right. the McDavid's, you know, every night. So I want to dive into your brain. Like, who do you think is going to be that cash cow for Florida or Edmonton? Like, do you, there's got to be one guy. I know you just mentioned a few names, but is there one of those yeah. in particular you're going to go hard on? Yeah, I think that there's there's two so far that have really stood out to me. Um, and I have a bit of a dark horse as well that I think might have a decent series. Uh, and and when I say this, I think that it, it really all comes down to, to Florida's side of things. It's hard to find value deeper in the Edmonton roster. Uh, you just don't get enough consistency to, like you said, take a guy like, like a Jamie Benn who is going to be offered at plus 105 to minus 110 any given night and and is a guy that you can count on to put the puck in the net or at least get chances to. Edmonton doesn't really have that. You got to be laying a bit a bit of chalk or at least looking at you know one and a half points for some of these guys that they have. But when you go to the Florida side of things, here are the guys that I think still have a lot of value uh, going forward in the series. I think that when you look at where Sam Bennett is right now and the way he's playing, I mean, every time he touched the puck last series, I was terrified. It seemed like he was a man on a mission coming back from that hand injury. Uh, you know, he had a shortened not shortened but last year in the postseason he got hurt too it feels like he was on a bit of a mission to prove that he can be one of the big names on this roster and mm -hmm. you've seen that it's allowed Paul Maurice to shake up the lines a little bit more and I say depth and I mentioned Sam Bennett but he's playing second line and center right now um, and it just speaks to the way this team can play and how Maurice can mix and match who, who his options are um, I mean it's something I've already you know grabbed grabbed a hold of myself as Sam Bennett to have a point in uh in in game one I think it was like plus 105 range on DraftKings, something pretty good. Um, and and one of his linemates, you know, you look at Evan Rodriguez, another guy I mentioned, uh, who I think is plus 160 on DraftKings to have a point. I absolutely love that line. I think that when you look at the way those two played, especially in game six, goals are hard to come by in the postseason. And especially when you get later in series and later in the postseason, it can be a lot harder to, to find guys to rely on. And you want to find people that, are consistently skating night in, night out with that edge, that juice is what, how I usually like to put it. And to me, that duo of Rodriguez and Bennett has enough grit to be a line that Maurice can roll with in the postseason when he needs like, you know, a physical jump, but also can add that scoring touch. We saw Bennett go bar down on Igor, one, probably one of the best shots in the postseason so far. So those are two guys, especially in game one, I'm looking at, you know, one thing I think is important to think about is that every series is different, right? Like a lot of people like to point to, you know, last five games or last 10 games or, you know, head to head performance, in the regular season. And I, I, I try to caution people at times at that because the playoffs are a very different animal. And I think you've seen a lot of people start to realize that where it's so much more matchup dependent. You've got guys really focusing in on how people play and, and trying to take away what they do best. And so it can be hard in game one to sometimes get a read on that. And you have to, I think, tread a little bit lighter when a series gets going. And then you sort of see in game two and three how certain guys are, are able to find their game a little bit more. But those are two guys that I think should be able to still do so against Edmonton. Looking at this series, I think one of the things that Harry and I have talked about a little bit is, you know, guys that maybe compared to last year for Florida, like Brandon Montour, who was all over the place, has been a little bit more on the quiet side this year. You know, are you looking at someone like him or Ekblad to step up in this series and to contribute points as well as just shut down defense? Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned Montour, right? He's someone who I was huge on in the Boston series because the way that he had played against them last year. I stayed away from him a little bit in the Rangers series. 
not just because I don't ever bet on Ranger games. I, I was still giving out some picks for those for people to take. But the reason I stayed away is that one of the things the Rangers do really well is they take away the actual point shot, not just, you know, getting the puck to the point. They allow you to get the puck there, but they take away that lane very well. And if you saw guys like Gustav Forsling have success offensively, it's because of the way that they were doing it. They were driving down below the tops of the circles to get that offense activated for their defensemen. So to me, Montour is the kind of guy where he adds that offense from deep on the point, deep on the blue line. He's got that shot that can be. That's why I think he didn't have as much success against the Rangers because they take away that lane. They force you to play it a little bit wider and then try to come down from the sides and get your shot from there. Now, unfortunately, Florida was able to find a lot of success doing that still. So for me, I'm interested to see, because Edmonton Edmonton plays a little bit lower in the, off, in the defensive zone, if Brandon Montour can find a little bit more space. He's, uh, he's plus 210, I think, to get an assist on DraftKings in game one. I almost feel like I just have to bet it on principle. Like <laughs> that's a guy that that can do it any given night. Still, at the end of the day, the talent levels off the charts. That just sounds like good investing. Awesome. Like that's that's positive finance. That's financial advice. That's financial <laughs> advice. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> can I say that on a podcast? I don't think. Oh so. yeah, no, it's okay. Um, but the, you know, I, I think that on top of Montour, the fact that we're getting Montour and Bouchard in a in a series as like the two offensive stud defensemen. That's something I'm really excited to watch too. Like Evan Bouchard's having one of the best postseasons any defenseman has ever had. Um, I see no reason for him not to continue. He's actually one of the other props that I've taken already for for game one. Him to have an assist is minus one ten. Edmonton can score one goal, and I'd still feel confident in that. So you know, despite them being on the road, I'm not as concerned, even though they aren't as powerful offensively there. Um, yeah, that's 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 kind of what I'm thinking in terms of. I think there's going to be some depth in defenseman adding offense in this series. I don't think you're going to see as much of the the run and gun that you saw from some of the big guns in Edmonton or or the way that against Boston, guys like Kachuk and Verhage were dominating that series. You saw Florida start to shift to their depth already to, to look for offense against the Rangers. I think they're going to keep doing it. Um, and, and I think that it's impossible to stop the Edmonton attack, but I think Florida's equipped to do it if anybody is. You see this being a tight checking series. I mean, obviously it's the cup final, so it's going to be a lot tighter than a regular season matchup. Everyone kind of knows that. But you look at that Florida, New York series, especially down the stretch, two ones, three twos, just really muddy hockey, as I would put it. Do you th- are you going to be looking at any like overs? Like maybe if we're getting at five and a half, six, or what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that I'm going to be staying away from overs at least when they're in Florida. When you turn to Edmonton and you head back to uh, to Alberta, something about you know Rogers Place and that arena, they just kind of they find their game a little bit better on the offensive sides of things. I can think of two reasons, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we already made the joke earlier. It's fun. That's set up too well. Yeah. Um, but I I think that it's similar to how how Colorado at home finds a little bit more success, right? Like Edmonton at home is one of those teams where they really take it to another level in front of their own fans. Um, and you start to feel like you're skating uphill against them. So for me, when you talk about physicality, how tight a series can be, how offensive teams are going to be able to be, I think that Edmonton might struggle a little bit with that in game one. Dallas had more success than that series is going to look like on paper. Um, game six. 35 to 10 shots on goal. We got a Stuart Skinner masterclass to stand the Edmonton Oilers to the Stanley Cup finals. And that is never a sentence I thought I would say in my life. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that that when you think about how Edmonton can be successful, they have to get pucks on it. They have to force a little bit of grittier game. They're going to have to accept a bit of a grittier game, I think, in game one. Because... They didn't find their game immediately and consistently against Dallas until they sort of started to figure out how to play against that grind style. And the issue with their matchup with Florida is that Florida has more speed than Dallas does throughout the top, the top 12, I'll give them top 12, you know, forwards and, and really all their defensemen too, you know, guys like Suter, Petrovic, they're not the most, you know, fast on their feet. And right. Dallas relies a lot on, you know, the top defensemen on their team. Florida is able to roll with a little bit more depth and, and comfortability throughout the lineup. 
And I think that they'll be able to find that gritty game that you talked about, Harrison, in, in, in against the Rangers. I think they'll have an easier time finding that in game one. This is without a doubt the farthest that two teams will have had to travel for a Stanley Cup final so far. Are you factoring that into any of your, you know, decisions when they change location at all? Does does ice quality factor into any of your decisions here? Because we're talking about, you know, ice in June in South Florida versus ice in Edmonton at professionally maintained Rexall Place that right. doesn't really share an arena with anyone else. So just curious if that's in your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think that's actually going to play more of a role than obviously it ever has. Uh, I don't think that's much of a hot take by me to say that. But what I'm interested to, to, to see is is not just the ice, but the way that, that each team starts the first period in those games. Are they going to be yeah. sitting yeah. back a little bit? Are they going to be like, all right, we both just had, you know, however many miles trip it is across basically all of North America. We're both okay to take our foot off the gas here for a little and, and let the game be, you know, 50 minutes instead of 60. Or do we see, you know, Edmonton get that jolt of being at home and pouncing on Florida early? Um, yeah. Rangers got an early goal against against uh, against Florida in game five, I want to say it was maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and and that goal, like they had the chance with the, they almost had a five on three. Gustafson took a penalty and it stayed five on four. Like, to me, Edmonton is a team that takes advantage of those opportunities a little bit better. And if Edmonton gets to one nothing early in the game, you know, game three or game four, all of a sudden it can snowball the way that we saw it did against Dallas, even with three shots on goal, it was two goals. Yeah, so it's true. I think that when you think about about that shift, that's what you want to look at is is what do they look like at the start of these games? And I don't think that it's necessarily something that is going to be so different than than how teams try to have handled it in the past because there, you can't present it different to your players you don't you probably don't even want to talk about the fact that it's the first two teams have had to travel you think about the fact that you can win the stanley cup if you keep going for seven more games and you play for another you know 420 minutes of hockey and maybe we'll get a little overtime in um i i, I think that it'll play a role but not as big I got a weird one for you. Nick can attest to this. I haven't been tweeting a lot of picks because I sucked in the first round. I was like, <laughs> you know what? If I'm going to be tweeting shit out, I at least want people to know I'm putting my my real elbow grease into it. And I just was like, it ain't happening this postseason. Whatever. Yep. But I have been doing these little like empty better group chat, no goal first 10 bets. I've been pretty successful so far. I got a weird one. I feel like every odd number game, so one, three, five, seven. There's yeah. travel yeah. in between. I like no goal first 10 and all the odd ones. I, I'm big on that. Dude. Plus money every time, too. It's like plus I, I, I really like I I really do. Because even yeah. with even with the way that Edmonton plays, right? Like, yeah, maybe they'll get a power play in the first 15 minutes. I'll take plus money that maybe they don't get one and Florida's penalty kill stays strong. Like it's been yeah. really good. And it's been really, really good. And so is Edmonton. So I don't think that the whole the whole power play thing is as scary as it has been in the past. And that would be like my big worry in those first 10 minutes of any of those games, right? Like if one team yeah. goes up a man, can they just put one in like that and I'm done? But it's funny you say that you like have been doing it kind of on the side because I'm in like one Discord uh, with these with these guys called Lock Hub and it, it's it's a good time. Got some good guys in there, but we, we've been ribbing a little bit of the no goal first 10 bets as well um we've been liking it in some of the dallas series in some of the dallas games uh, and that's then under bad. first under one and a half in the first period too uh at times that's been a good one but but some people flipped to the over when uh when the series went back to edmonton it's fun it, it's a sweat and you get plus money i i like it but um all right we're gonna put you on the spot now uh you, who do you got as your series winner and i want to hear con smite prediction as well all right so Winning the series, I I always have a hard time betting against the best players in the world, but in this situation, I do think that Florida gets it done. Okay, um, I think they've got the depth. I think they've got the goaltending. I will still continue to somewhat bet against Stuart Skinner because I just I don't fully believe that he's done this. I just don't. Um, and and I think that. When you look at how far it is built, they're the best team that's built to handle McDavid. They were in the finals last year. They got embarrassed in the finals last year. Yeah. And they like when you look at the guys on that roster, 
I don't think they took very kindly to that because those aren't guys that I think would, would just, you know, sit back and take it, especially when you have a Matthew Kachuk leading your team. Um, so I, I've got Florida. Uh, for Con Smythe, I think that there could be a lot of a lot of choices here. Mm-hmm. I would argue that Barkov is a good play. Yeah, if he shuts down McDavid and adds seven points, yeah, give it, give it to him. In. Give it to him. I agree. I don't see Bob dominating this series enough to run away with it, even though. It, Usually can, you know, you can lean on a great goalie for that, for that pick. Um, and, and we've seen a little bit more of, of acknowledgement for the two-way player in the NHL. And if Barkov can add that level of offense and shut down the best talent we've ever seen. It's a lot. I'd give it to him. I don't know yeah. the odds. I, I honestly haven't even looked. I'm going to pull it up right now. So draft has got there. Good friends over at DraftKings. Right now, we've got Barkov at plus 400 to win the Conn Smythe. And it's really funny because McDavid's clearly the front runner because I feel like if Edmonton wins, it's I don't foresee anybody taking it from him. Yeah. But if Florida wins, like you said, you've got Barkov, Bobrovsky, and Kachuk all kind of within uh, a scent of each other, which is you know about what you would expect. Um, yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that. So uh, real quick before we wrap up the interview, uh, fix the New York Rangers in three steps this offseason for me. I, I, I love, thought you were going to say three words because I do have three words that would also fix the New York Rangers. I would love to hear the three words. Oh, hit us. Buy out Jacob Trouba. Oh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, he's in uh, He's in a lot of headlines today. Holy. Yeah, and listen, I don't hate him like the way that a lot of people seem to. Also, I'm in no way in the world to say this, but like Pasha's stance to – to bring in his charity and his wife and all that is so soft, but also I was kind of soft to true, but even answer. Don't give him the fucking time of day. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you at all. So first step is get rid of Truba. It won't happen. That's my pipe dream. Like get rid of Truba, throw the C on Vinny Trocek all day. Give it to him. Not what I do think is more. No, I don't think I I love Kreider. Like quick, funny story. His first game ever was a playoff game. I went to it uh, in like 2012. Oh, let's go. He had just played against BC. It played for BC in the national championship. He comes in, scores a goal against Marty Brodeur against the Devils. I'm fucking losing it as a kid. <laughs> they didn't even sell Crowder jerseys yet. I made my oh, dad man. buy me a plain Ranger jersey. We went around the corner to the garden. This is all right after the game. This shop, I, they probably don't even have these anymore. They sewed the letters on for me. Crider 20, sleeves and everything, the whole nine yards. I still have it. I wear it to watch every game. So I do love Chris Crider. I do love Chris Crider. But felt like the heart and soul of the team was Vinny Trocek. Like he, in his, in his exit interview uh, this year, he said, it felt like we really started to build a culture and an identity of this team and that the people started to buy in more. And it's, you know, maybe Crowder saying stuff like that behind doors, but, you know, it doesn't seem like he's as vocal. And the Rangers have had a lot of not as vocal captains in their recent history from Callahan to McDonough, now to Truva. You've had guys that try to lead by example on the ice. And I think that a lot of them have done a great job. But maybe you need a guy that does a little bit of both now, that's a little bit more vocal and has that grit. You saw Trocek, what was it, in Carolina when they scored and he was putting it all on Ajo's face, like, He's a menace. I love that. I love that. He's got he's got that thing that that gets under people's skin. He's got a little bit of what guys like Marshan and the Kachuk brothers have. And to me, that's who you want, like leading you into fucking battle, into the Stanley Cup Finals. Like that's who's going to do it. It's not going to be a guy that is flat footed and makes terrible decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't necessarily disagree with you, and I know a and lot. I don't think it's of... fair to bring Matt Rempe into this discussion, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of Rangers fans are on the same bandwagon as you are. So, yeah, I think that that the team will look pretty similar um, at the end of the day to how it did this year. You you can't blow it up that much. You just don't have the flexibility to. Um, you got guys like Offman coming in. I think Zach Jones yeah. comes in. Gustafson's gone. Probably Wenberg, Roslovic, they're all gone. Um, so what, what what I think happens is maybe they make one decent move in the offseason. I don't expect a ton. 
the big splash would be if they move out Kako and I'm hearing or not hearing I'm just reading that like Brady Kachuk is someone the Rangers want to go after and Jacob Chikrin but like Rangers Twitter is psychotic and they come up with pipe dream trades all the time um so you know maybe something materializes around a right wing or a a big defenseman I I think the Rangers need to take a page out of like a Vegas and a Florida and an Edmonton book where you have defensemen that are over six feet tall and not just one of them Um, true yeah, I love I Ryan Lindgren, but like he's a smaller Dan Girardi, and that doesn't seem to fly as much in the NHL this year. And he had a really bad year. Um, he's never been healthy. I'm convinced. Yeah, he, he no no chance. Um, <laughs> he's been chronically hurt his entire all, career. his whole career, maybe his whole life. Who knows? Um, you know he he's a UFA. I think so. I could see him back on a one year, but I could also see him walk in if somebody offers him some big money. Like maybe Utah wants a, a veteran. I guess at this point, like Ryan Lindgren, who can establish some culture. Um, yeah. but yeah, that's, that's kind of what I think happens. I unfortunately don't think it changes too much. Love to see Zach Jones get a crack at that lineup full time. We had him on what, Harry, it. like a couple years ago, Harry. And that was a fantastic interview. Yeah, that was, um, we had him on, I think, was it the off season? And that was when they hired, um, Gallant. Gallant, yeah. yeah. We had him on, and the, it, the ESPN notification came on my phone. They hired Gallant, and we we read it to him. He's like, oh, wait, really? And I was like, yeah, we just <laughs> broke that news to you, dude. Cool for us. Oh, well, that's uh, pretty damn cool. Yeah, uh, yeah cool. I think he's a great nice player. player. I, I think he should should be in the lineup. I thought he should have been in for Truba even at times uh, in this postseason. Um, I'm excited to see what he brings. I, I, I At Providence, he was great. So I, we've seen flashes of it in the NHL. Uh, so I think that, you know, with maybe a full season, he could he could really start to become something pretty solid for Rangers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we appreciate your time, Jackson. Uh, definitely going to be uh, retweeting some of your picks, tailing some of those picks. Me, Nick, and Mac is our third, but he's unavailable um, for this time slot. But we're all going to be together this weekend. I know we'll be ripping some of your stuff. So uh, good luck this Stanley Cup Thank final. You. Great job so far this postseason. Keep it up. Uh, I'm not going to say go Rangers because I can't do that, but I won't either. That's fair. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Wait, who, who do you guys like? Oh, I see who you like over there, Nick. You got the fucking, the caps hat behind you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Listen, I'm a... when Ovi won, I was happy for him. I thank I you. I appreciate that. Say it. Like that was awesome. That was awesome. You saw so, a guy who really deserved it. Yeah. So Nick and Mac are diehard caps fans. I'm a diehard penguins fan. So it's a great, it's a great marriage. We keep podcast. it spicy. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Sorry. I'm surprised right. that it's been like able to stick together for this long. Well, the good news is both of those teams have not been great <laughs> in the years that we've been doing this podcast. <laughs> so it's helped a little bit, but uh, we still haven't had them play each other in the playoffs while doing this. But if and when we get that, that's going to get on. That's that's going to be... have to all try to get to a few of those. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's going to be the perfect uh, the perfect storm. But uh, yeah, man, we appreciate the time. Good luck. Huge thanks to Puck Picks for coming on the show. It was really nice to meet him and uh, get chatting with him. Definitely going to be telling some of his picks for the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, that interview was also presented by DraftKings. Nick, I think you have a word from our friends over at DK. Absolutely, I do. Fellas, you guys know we are this close to crowning the Stanley Cup champion. And with the action heating up on the ice, it's even hotter over at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. If you're new to DraftKings, go ahead and listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least five, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks if, it's, if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER in West Virginia or visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY to 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, one no, one no sweat bet per <laughs> customer issued as one bonus bet based on amount of initial losing bet. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash ice for eligibility. 
wagering and deposit restrictions, terms and responsible gaming resources, copyright NHL 2024, all rights reserved. The fitness gram pasters test is a multi-level step. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like that is, that is just so brutal, boys. What That's what I thought. I just That's ran a I... couple of errands. I had a, uh, you know, I, I stopped by the cleaners, picked up my dry cleaning. I Have got you my finished those change. errands? <laughs> Have you finished just, those errands? Just when I thought that it was over, it went twice as long. Impre- you did a hell of a lot better than I did, though. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, kudos. That was rough. All right. Let's hop into the Stanley Cup finals. We've got some fun facts for the series to kick it off. Corey Perry becomes the first player in NHL history to reach the cup finals with five different NHL teams, the Ducks, the Canadians, the Lightning, the Stars, and the Oilers. Damn, that would have been a good trivia. Name all the teams that Corey Perry has made the cup finals with. Okay, spoiler alert. The trivia question at the end, do not look this up, has something to do with this. All right, leave it at that. We'll find out later. This is kind Uh, of an insane stat, though. Like, do you guys, just based on how the NHL is now, like, one, I'm surprised this wasn't, like, a guy from, like, the 80s or 90s. But, two, do you think this would ever get broken? I was trying to think, like, is there anyone active that's, like, five different teams that go to the cup final? If anything, I I feel like the most likely to do it would be like a, like a journeyman backup goalie or something like that. You know what I mean? Like right. somebody that, that just everyone knows they can rely on as a second option, but doesn't end up playing much, but is on the bench for all those teams or something like that. But I think it could get broken. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of suitcases around these days. I'm trying to think of like, you know, you think like third line guys, first thing I thought was Pat Maroon, but they were all with Tampa and St. Louis. So, well, the thing is you have to be such a specific kind of player because you can't right. be the kind of player that gets traded so much because you're a cancer or nobody likes you like, or you're not valuable. Right. You have to be the kind of guy that gets moved so much that you're just, you're just super like utility to anybody. Like, Oh, what about like Eric Gustafson? Hasn't he played for like four different teams, four years in a row or something like that? I think so. So that's a guy like if anything, it'll be like a fucking second pairing defenseman like that or somebody like that that just gets yeah. moved at the deadline every year and, and re-ups for one year the next year or something like that. True. Think about like I know this hasn't happened, but a guy like Taylor Hall, like a good player, but he's moved around a bit. You know, you get Edmonton, Jersey, Chicago, Boston. Like he's been on a bunch of different teams. Good player, but never been to the finals, I don't think. Yeah. Um So, yeah, the only bad piece of news for the Oilers is Perry hasn't won the Cup since 07. So he's kind of on a little bit of a losing streak, some could say. So uh, we'll see if he can snap that one. Uh, Another fun fact, the top four picks from the 2014 NHL draft are all playing in this Cup final. Ekblad was taken one by Florida. Uh, Sam Reinhart taken two by Buffalo. Dreisaitl three by Edmonton. And Sam Bennett, number four by Calgary. So that is a pretty cool little stat from that 14 draft. Uh, In case you just want to suffer from a little bit of depression, uh, round out the top 10 from that draft, just for a little fun fact. Michael DeCall, five. Jake Vertanen, six. Hayden Fleury, seven. William Nylander at eight. Ehlers at nine. And Nick Ritchie at 10. So uh, some really cool names in there too. Larkin, Osternock. Kempe, all those guys. So where did Larkin go in that draft? 15 to the Detroit Red Wings, obviously. And Mr. Sonny Milano was taken right after him. Wow. Now a Washington Capitol, your guys' team. Uh, There are six former Buffalo Sabres (laughs) representing the Panthers in this series. Ocposo, Reinhardt, Montour, Rodriguez, Kulikov, and Rasmus Asplund, even though he hasn't played a game in these playoffs. Yet, uh, if you're a Sabres fan, you got to be kicking yourself. There's been some pretty funny Sabres accounts that have had some fun with this one. It's just, it's too good. It's too good. It's like, maybe don't trade everyone away all at once at the deadline. Like, (laughs) like, what are you doing? Like six on one team? I I saw a screenshot the other day from a Sabres. I was like, how did we not make the playoffs with this lineup? And it was like Evander Kane, 
Jack Eichel, Sam Ryan, like just stud after stud after stud. I'm like, oh my God. That's... Ryan O'Reilly. Yeah, like that's painful, right? Like they were all there. And probably like Olmark and goal or something like that too. Right. Yeah. They're like, no, what we're going to do is suck and draft four very good puck moving defensemen for like the first four consecutive overall picks four years in a row. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's that's pain. But uh, last fun stat. This will officially be the most miles traveled in a Stanley Cup final in NHL history. The two cities are 4,089 kilometers away. I will give you Americans three seconds to try to convert that to miles. Three, two, one. That comes out to 2,541 miles apart from each other. That's crazy. Uh, I think that passes Vancouver and Boston in 2011. That's Definitely most traveled cup final uh i know a lot of people have been complaining about the amount of time between games if this does go seven <laughs> we're going to be spending the whole month of june talking about this which kind of rocks in some ways but also kind of doesn't um maybe that's a good thing given all the travel for these guys because that's that's pretty brutal it kind of sucks for the players like you mentioned it if this goes seven we're handing out the stanley cup on the 24th of june which is like a full month too late in my opinion so I think the league's got to step up and do something about this at this point. I know we're still kind of skewed from the lockdown pause way back when, but like, I I think you have to hand out the Stanley cup no later than the first week of June. Also don't uh, let's not let them off the hook here and pretend this is a travel thing. The, the dates were set while the conference finals were still going on. We could have had a Rangers Dallas stars cup final, which is not that bad of travel at all. And this would still be the same schedule. So that's true. Yeah. Worked out. Maybe it worked out nicely. I think I read there's only two, like at the end of the Western conference finals, someone was like, there's only two hockey games in the next 11 days, which is crazy. So anyways, uh, let's move on to the storylines. This series, the most talked about one is definitely going to be Mr. Connor McDavid playing in his first Stanley cup finals. It is going to be, a media circus with this guy. He can't even get beer in Edmonton. We all saw the clip that went around online of people harassing him. This guy needs private security ASAP. Let's just put that out there. But this is going to be talked about. His contract is going to be up in two years after this season. Leon's up for the extension after this year. It's going to be if they lose, what's going to happen? Is the boy going home to Toronto like everybody wants to say, oh, he's going to be a Leaf. Like, is he going to go to an American market? Does he want to get out of Edmonton? What does Dreisaitl do? He's the first domino to fall. If the Oilers lose, that is going to be all offseason long. If they win, I would probably say he's an Oiler for life. I would agree with you. I think even if they go down two games to nothing to like fire off this series, I think you're starting to see that narrative come up because the Edmonton media is just on a different planet right now. But yeah, it's absolutely going to be the storyline. Anytime you have the face of the league, which let's be real, that's what Connor McDavid is at this point, you know, competing for a championship and adding to his legacy and, you know, of course, because he plays in Edmonton, all the comparisons to Gretz and everything, and we've seen their conversations back and forth as this has panned out over the playoffs, it's going to be the narrative. In my opinion, anything else is like a, a subplot to this. Mac, your thoughts on this potential contract drama? Yeah, I mean, to me, the fact that they're here, they've gotten further than they have since, I think you mentioned it earlier, what, 05 or 06 or something like that. Um, that alone, I know Oilers fans aren't going to look at, look at it this way. Neither are probably any of the players on the team, but to me, that alone at least solidifies that it's like, all right, everybody can calm down. We got to the cup final. This is how my brain works. I always just try to compute it to like what this would have been for the capital situation. Ovechkin didn't get out of the fucking second round until 2018. Like that is that is, oh, this guy is getting traded next year if if they don't do it, you know, that kind of thing. To me, it's like, all right, this is a great sign. We know he's capable. To me, if it, it's like if they lose, I think that's just way more of it. I mean, we'll have to see how it would play out. But in general, I think that's way more a testament of just them running into a really fucking loaded Panthers team than it being like panic mode and being like, oh, my God. 
McDavid and Dreisaitl need to move, all this stuff. Is that how it's going to get treated? Probably not, because again, that's how the Oilers media is. That's how Canadian hockey markets are. Um, but yeah, to your point, if they win the cup this year, probably both of those guys, at least McDavid, are uh, are lifers, I would say. It is going to be interesting. Um, this is year nine, I believe, for McDavid, which is crazy, right? Next year is going to be year 10. This is the first time he's making the finals. Um, Took Ovi, like what, 12? What is it, 2004 to 13, maybe? Yeah, about 05 30, to 18. 13. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, some old faces in new places. There is a little bit of history between some players on each team. Uh, Kachuk and Bennett, all too familiar with that bad blood in Alberta back from that 2022 series between the Flames and Oilers. The Oilers won that game in five, and Evander Kane dominated Matthew Kachuk. I don't know if that's going to be the case in this series. I know Kane's a little dinged up, uh, but that series was nasty. That series was mean. And I know when the series shifts back to Alberta, those two are going to be hearing it from the crowd specifically. Was that the one that had that crazy, like disallowed goal or the one that there was like some controversial play that the Oilers won like a, uh, an OT game on. I think, I think it was, but. If, if y'all can't remember, don't worry about it. I don't think I can. I can't remember what I ate for breakfast, but yeah. Um, <laughs> All good. It's 2020. I do remember McDavid icing that series in overtime, I believe. That was the yep. first career OT winner yet. Um, so that is definitely going to be a storyline. Evander Kane, Matthew Kachuk, they were at each other's throats in that series. And then you know Bennett, what he's going to bring. Uh, this is my favorite storyline coming up. What is, what's the saying? Unstoppable force meets what? Why am I blanking on this? Immovable object. Yes, that is what we have right now between McDavid and Barkov. Real quick, just so I'm not crazy, confirmed. Um, it was a controversial. Uh, Blake Coleman, it, it redirected off his skate. Oh. The Flames would have won the game late in the third period, but it got overturned. They said he kicked it. He fucking didn't. No, he I definitely fucking that. didn't. And uh, so it went to overtime. The Oilers won, and that was the deciding game. That was game five. Oh, that's brutal. Um, but, yeah, Sparkoff, McDavid. This is going to be an excellent matchup. You get both of them in their prime, just dominant forces colliding in the cup finals. Barkov, Selkie winner this year. He's been unbelievable in this postseason. And, Nick, you said earlier no one's talking about him. Everyone's going to be talking about him. For the rest of his career after the run that he's had, no longer on that underrated list, I'd say he's solidified himself in that top 10 in the league. Uh, here's some stats for him against some of the opposing teams' star players so far this playoffs. In the round against Tampa, he played 27 minutes of ice against Kucherov and held him to zero goals. In 35 minutes of ice time against Pasternak, he held him to only one goal. And in 23 minutes of ice time against Panarin in that third round, he held him to zero goals. So this guy has been shutting down star power all postseason. And I think it's fitting that the final test, the final boss of the video game is going to be the best player in the world. Give me, give me 33 minutes of ice time against McDavid this series. And he holds him to two. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I think, not saying McDavid I think might anyone not, would take those numbers. McDavid yeah. might score more than two, but against while Barkov's on the ice, I'm going 33 minutes and two. That's fair. Speaking of goals, I'm just going to throw this out there because I know it was all over the internet. Zach Hyman, I think he has 13 right now. Sounds the right. All-time, all-time record's 19. He's, he's pressing. What year did Gretzky do that? I honestly don't. I can't. I don't know. It's definitely Gretzky, right? It, it has, has to, to be. be. There's no one else who could have done I'll, something like that, right? I don't think so. Um, I think Mac is going to fact check that. But yeah. Um, another storyline we've talked about the Oilers' power play at length. Uh, kind of cooled down in that series against Dallas, but they have an unbelievable penalty kill. I think they've killed like 28 straight penalties in that series, um, which is a crazy streak. They have the number one power, or I'm sorry, penalty kill in the playoffs so far. And guess who's number two? The Florida Panthers. So we've got a great battle of PKs here. 
I also think that puts a ton of pressure on both of their power plays sort of inversely because they know that anytime they're out there, it's not going to be easy. And anytime they can convert, that's a huge advantage for that club. So I I think that's going to be a fantastic matchup to watch. This is crazy. This is not what we thought. Oh, the most in a single postseason was Yari Curry with 19 for the Oilers in 84, 85. He's actually tied with Reggie Leach of the Flyers who did it in 75, 76. They both had 19 in separate singular postseasons. Um, after that, it's actually Sackick with 18, 95, 96. And then there's a buttload of people tied with 17, including Gretz, who did it in 84, 85. Yeah, gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Nice pool. Yep. So uh, last thing, we said it earlier, both teams overcame a 2-1 series deficit. We kind of just laid out the, the law of the land, if you will. Um, I'll let you guys give any final comments you have, but if you don't have any, let's get a uh, a series winner. How many games the series goes, and then we'll get a uh, Con Smythe edition. So I'm going to go last on this one because okay. you you two, I think everyone knows, if you've been listening to this throughout the playoffs, I kind of have a hunch of where the two of you are going. So I'm going to go last for these. Yeah, that's fair. I'll open it up. I'm going to go with the Panthers. I really wanted to go six. I've been thinking about it all day. I really think there's a chance that we get treated to a seven game series in the cup finals this year. I will go the Panthers in seven and my con Smythe, ladies and gentlemen, is Sir Gay motherfucking Bobrovsky. He's back on the case. Officer Bob. I don't hate that at all. Uh, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I, this, you want to know why I hate this? Because I got a good feeling of who Nick is going to pick. And the smart money goes to Florida. I admit that if you're smart for the value, they're the better team. They're the deeper team. They have the experience. They did it last year. It would be very fitting if they did it this year. I can't remember the last time a team went back-to-back cup finals and lost both of them. I don't know when the last time that happened was. So knowing all of that, I am still going to take the Edmonton Oilers. And I believe that with players in the same breath as Lemieux, Crosby, Gretzky, those kind of guys, when you're in that breath, you have to have a cup. And, And any guy who gets to that point knows it. McDavid knows it. This is his destiny. This is the prophecy. This was foretold that that this would happen at some point in his Oilers career because that's what you sign up for when you get a guy who, you know, is going to give you a lottery pick like he did in 15 with that amount of coverage and that amount of hype. Uh, I'm going to go with the Oilers. McDavid's going to win it. Uh, Let's put it this way. If the Oilers win the cup and McDavid doesn't win the Conn Smythe, I'd be shocked. There's no way that doesn't happen. Um, I'm going to go Oilers in six. Home ice. The X factors will be out in Edmonton. Everything will become an absolute riot. And you're going to see the most insane Twitter clips you've ever seen in your entire internet life. We haven't had a ton of uh, home ice championships in the, in the last decade or two. So that'd be interesting. Just Vegas last year, right? Is one of the ones that comes to mind and none of the Tampa ones count because they weren't really at home and there weren't fans in attendance. So I think, uh, I think that 22 team, that was like one of the weird times where like Florida could do whatever they wanted and nobody, nobody else could. Um, I think they won at home. Did the but... Avs win at home? Mm, I don't think so. No, I don't think okay. I think it was in Tampa. Gotcha. Yeah. I could be wrong. Nick, what you got? All right, boys. You know, I was coming into this today, and honestly, until we started recording, I had no idea who I was going to pick for this one because I was going back in my head, back and forth all day long, you know, head versus heart. And what I've come to realize is that if you can beat a Dallas Stars team that has beaten the Vegas Golden Knights and has beaten the Colorado Avalanche, You know what? You can probably go ahead and beat anyone else. So if the Oilers can get it to six, I think they get it done. 
Harry, you nailed it. McDavid is the con Smythe, or they don't win the cup. This is like when the Caps won the cup, and Kuznetsov 1000% should have won the con Smythe. Ovi gets it, of course. So um, I'm going to go oil and six. I just, you know, once That's now that they've man. made it here, I just can't pick against McDavid and Dreisaitl's will to push this team just a little bit more over the edge. And that was such a hard pick for me to make because Harry, you nailed it. Florida's the better team. Florida's the best team. I think on paper coming into this postseason, they were probably the best team in the NHL all year. I, I would say they're probably one of the most loaded teams we've seen in the cup final in the last five to 10 you could probably throw Vegas from last year into that conversation as well. Um, without a doubt, I think the Oilers get it done. McDavid hands the cup to Dreisaitl right away, and then it goes to, I would say, Nuge right after that, if I had my choice. I agree with that order. I agree with that order. You guys didn't eat enough catnip this morning? <laughs> And Nick, like it, it sucks because I will actively be rooting for the Panthers to win the Stanley Cup final, but I I don't know. It's just it's the superstar factor right now for me. I know it's hockey and one player can't will you to a championship, but what I've seen out of this guy this year is just different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, wow, I'm shocked. I didn't think that you. Uh, I didn't think you'd go that way, Mac. Real quick, any guesstimations on uh, who you think? The Florida, uh, her Barkoff would toss it off to after he gets it. Uh, probably either Kachuk or Babo. If Babo wins the con Smythe, like I said, maybe it's him. He's been through a lot. I would say like maybe like a Poso in there too. Like he's been around yeah. for so long. Yeah. Could be Barkov too. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of options, obviously. Wow, Nick, you shocked me. I'm not, I would, and by the way, I'm not necessarily rooting for the Oilers. I'm kind of an insecure like Crosby fanboy in this scenario. Like I don't want the comparisons. I don't want people saying he's better. I don't need that. So if Florida wins, I'm fine. How did you I, handle it in 18 when everyone was saying Obi's better? Uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking oh, about? Oh man. Boys, let's uh, do some trivia. Mom. Yep. Yeah, we'll uh we'll wrap it up here with some trivia which is presented by Elwoods. Mac, I think you got a word from our friends. Indeed, a reminder to support your local dive bar and have a beer at Elwood's Liquor and Tap, home of the Pizza Luge. Uh, in the heart of downtown Milwaukee, this is a 70s-inspired bar. It's got a little something for everybody. Everybody, Daily happy hour, rotating taps, and free birthday perks. I got myself a nice little Elwood's mug that I actually ended up leaving at the bar. I need to go pick it up. It's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, head on down there. They will definitely be doing... Uh, watch parties for all the cup games and uh, yeah, it'll be on all the TVs. If you wear Oilers or Panthers gear, you can get some free shots when your team scores. So no reason not to be there. We'll see you down at Elwoods. All right. I'll tee it off. It's going to be hard. I'll give you hints. I know we got to wrap up here soon. Uh, so as we mentioned, Corey Perry sets the record five different teams to go to the cup final. He was originally before this year tied with one, two, three, four, five other players who have been to the finals with four different teams. Uh, can you guys name any of the other guys who went with four different teams? Marion Hosa got to be one of them. He is not one of them. Fuck, he probably did it with three. I was thinking Maroon, and I, I think he just went like, what, three years in a row, but not with different teams because he went with Tampa twice, right? Correct. So I will uh, I will give you a hint. Every person is retired. Okay. And most of these guys are going to be in your 80s, 90s, 2000s. There's a couple. There's one dinosaur on here, but most of these guys you'll have heard of. Will oh. we even, is there any chance we get the dinosaur? Yeah, Mac and I are big 40s hockey buffs, so we, <laughs> we, we might be able to get that one. Hunston Armo Doyle. I, I don't think so. I just tell, so. just tell us that one. Leslie uh, Juggernaut Dean, Johnson. So Dean Al, Machine O'Goolsby. So Al Arbor is one of them. Detroit, <laughs> okay. Chicago. Okay. That's legend. fair. That legend. Yeah. yeah. Detroit, Chicago, Leafs, Blues. Uh, Ab McDonald is another one. Abe, but it's only AB. I don't know. I, I'm showing my abs. Yeah. Prowess here. What's uh, uh, Iron Abs, Crabs, or what, what, what's the, uh, is that what it is? Iron Abs? 
Ab McDonald, Canadians, Hawks, Wings, Blues. So there's three names left. You do know these three names. One of them is a bona fide Hall of Famer. And the other two are like guys that you have heard of, but they're not Hall of Famers. Chris Chelios. So you're no, but you're in the right era and at the right position. Okay. Mm. You only have to get one of these. I'm I'm not gonna go for all three of you guys. Is uh four teams though? That doesn't make sense. I can think of a few that I'm pretty sure did three, but you might, you might. I can think of so many for two. It's like then just getting past the three is hard. Like part of me wants to say Pronger because of the Oilers and then the Ducks, but he is not one of them. So there's three guys left. Um, Two of them are defensemen. And Nick, one of them is a Hall of Fame defenseman in the same breath as Chris Chelios, same era as well. So there's only one forward. And he's kind of the forward is a major depth guy. Like Harry, not oh, really? I think I have one of the defensemen, and I think he's a guy that's near and dear to your heart from the nineties. Would you agree with me? Probably. It's Paul Coffey. And he's going to the cup with the Oilers this year. Ding yep. ding ding. He did that's it with fun. The, so that's wait, hold on. Let me see if I can get this real quick. Penguins, Oilers, Red Wings. That the last team's the one that screwed me. I was like, really? Oh. I got Liars. nothing. What? Liars? Yeah. What the fuck? What? Yeah. When did that happen? Couldn't tell you. No clue. Uh, gotcha. Okay. Um. So there's two left. I don't want to drag it out too long, but I do think you could get the defenseman on here if you thought hard enough. I uh, want the depth guy. What it, is the depth the, guy kind of newer, like 2000s maybe or no? He's like 90s, 2000s, and then uh, the defenseman is like – 90s 2000 so i'll give you a hint because you'll never the depth guy we for sure know though right nick i've heard nick say his name before you probably know him too. that's a good sign yeah okay um <laughs> the depth guy went with the calgary flames in 2004 and lost hmm. to the tampa bay lightning oh is it like fucking uh hold on hold on hold on the depth guy's the forward yep forward Mac, you focus on the forward. I'm going to focus on okay. the D guy All for right. a second. Yep. Let me uh, think. Let me think. It's not Nick. Robin Regeer, is it? It's not, but that's when you said that name, that's so in the same like breath as this guy. So, Nick, for your defenseman, you will probably remember this guy as a member of the Dallas Stars. That's who I think of. Mac, when I think of the forward, I think of Calgary in that cup run. Is it Kevin Hatcher? No. So to wrap this up, to make it go quicker, because I know Mac has to go soon, I'll give you guys the te- the teams that each one went with, give you one more guess, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. So Mac, for your forward, he went to the finals with the Oilers, the Canucks, the Hurricanes, and the Flames. This is all in like that 2000s era. And then Nick, for your defenseman, he went with the Kings, uh, the Dallas Stars, the Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Can you say mine one more time? Edmonton, Vancouver, Carolina, Calgary. Both these guys are like 2000 to 2008, kind of. Edmonton, Vancouver, Carolina, and Calgary. I got oh. nothing. Yeah, like, hold I have on. absolutely nothing. Maybe if I help you with this, Nick, it'll help. I believe his number with all the teams, at least I know that with Pittsburgh, I believe he was number five. I think he wore number five. It's not like fucking um, like Jelena or something, right? <laughs> Is that actually it? Yes. Marty that, Jonah. That, that's the, I couldn't even think of his first name, but that was the name I was trying to come up with because – Let's I remember go. I only remember him being on the flames, but I I, I just I remember just, that like bonkers radio call from them yes. winning the game where the guy's like, Yeah, baby. Marty yeah, Jonah. That's the only what a call. That's the oh, only one I I, I could not have fucking told you the other teams he played. He played for Carolina. Yeah, you're that doesn't make any sense. You are the king, Marty fucking Jonah. What the shit? 
That's crazy. Nick, I lied. Um, okay, thank he you. He was number five was like... on the number five on the Penguins, but routinely a number forty-four. Dallas Star. Yuri Lettinen. No. Hold on, okay. hold on. What's the uh, what's the what's the last initial? Like the first letter of his last name. Yeah. Correct. S. Twelve hundred and ninety-one career NHL games. Wow. Played a long time. Who drafted him? The LA Kings. Okay. But I would like I said, I'd think of him as a Dallas star when I when I think of him. He was on that cup run team that lost or that uh beat Buffalo in okay. ninety nine. So on there with Madano, Kevin Hatcher. And he wore number Zubov. 44. Yeah, he played D with Sheldon Zubov. Surrey. You're so close, kind of, but not really. You're so Damn. close. Damn. Uh, You're, the next name you think of is going to be it, I promise. There's only one that you could probably remember. The fact that you got Hatcher and Zubov. I'm guys, just getting like, everyone else. <laughs> it's like the last guy in the top four. I want to say it's so bad, but I don't want to ruin it. Ah, What's the first think. initial? D. His initials are DS. First round pick by the LA Kings in 1990. So many steering wheel punchers right now. Same. Do you want me to give it to you? No, I no, oh. no, no, no. I want this. Hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. So stars. Bolts, Kings, and who else? The Penguins. He, the he Penguins. was on the he was on the 08, 09 team with the Crosby. And, yes, against the Wings. Oh, Didn't God. really play a lot, but he was good with Dallas. And his last name starts with S. And his first name starts with D. Okay. <laughs> Steering wheel punch. Born in Edmonton. Mac, do you have anything or no? <laughs> this is so tough. I'm I'm it's just hard. I just don't want to let him say it because I feel like I'm gonna get so mad. I'm gonna get infuriated it. when he says this answer. Uh the last hint, and this probably won't help you. But nationality. This is the last... No. So in 2003 and 2004, he went to the cup final with Tampa. He beat Calgary where he's from, he was traded mid-season from Columbus to Tampa to help them win this cup as a defenseman. I believe he was a defensive pairing with Dan Boyle, if my memory is correct. I'm giving up. I'm throwing When you the say towel. like DS and defenseman, I'm like, it, it, there's no way in hell. Like, but And I know this is wrong because he never played for any of these teams. I'm like Damon Severson, but... No. All right, I got to give it to you. For yeah, just give it time. to me. Daryl Sador. Oh, fuck me. That's a good one. Fuck, I probably could have gotten that. I just... Just, if if we hung out enough, maybe. Yeah. But... yeah. Shit. That's a tough one, man. That was the... good. I do Come not on. remember him being on that Penguins team at me all. Me neither at all. He was... Did he, like, not play? Depth guy. Gotcha. Depth guy. Couple games, yeah. yeah. I honestly um... don't remember him on that uh, that Lightning team either. No, that that Marty Jonah pool is one of the best trivia that's, pools of all time. Yeah, that's the guy. As soon as you said Flames, that's the guy I was trying to think of because didn't he score a big goal? Like he scored yeah. one yeah. or two big goals at least yeah. in that Cup final. But absolutely, almost Marty scored Jonah. the the winner. But uh, yeah, that, yeah, we didn't the, have replay back. Then. Well, that's the other reason I think I I know him mainly is because is because of that. Yeah, yeah. All right, All right, I have well, a quick uh, one. Super, one. super quick. So the last time the Cats were in the cup final and other than last year was 96. They got swept by the Avs in four games. In that game four, the Avs won the Stanley Cup in overtime. Who scored the goal? I just based on stats, I'm going to go Sakic. Hmm. 
Do you want initials? Yeah, sure. This is running long. First name starts with a U. Last name starts with a K. What? What? U K E. Ulf. No, <laughs> idiot. Duh. Hey, this is a tough one. Oh, you said super easy. Super yeah, quick, this... yeah. Super quick, yeah. U K. I don't. Ulysses. I... Yes, that no. What name no. starts with U? Do you want me to just give it to you? What's yeah. the nationality, real quick? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. Okay, then yeah, give it to me. Yui Krupp. I would have never, never. Yeah. First never even name heard of spelled U W E. Last name is like K R U P P or something like that. Jesus never Christ! Heard of him. Yeah, I never think it was like him. first career playoff goal, only career playoff Yui goal. Yui Krupp. Yep. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> I hate that flavor. <laughs> All right. This trivia segment has gone on long enough. Jesus. Thanks to Elwoods for sponsoring it. And thanks to all the steering wheel punchers who hung around. Shout out to Mac oh. for the Marty Jonah pool. Uh, all right. Cup finals. They're underway. We're going to see each other on Saturday. Be on the lookout for maybe another episode. We'll see. Who knows? Maybe a YouTube video. Don't know. Uh, any last final notes? I got yep. a reservation at Coco's. I'm going to go eat a crab cake. Go Bears. Yes, sir. All right. Without further ado. Class dismissed. Class dismissed.